Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Lively U Virtual Learning Academy program presented by the Wood County Committee on Aging. Our topic today is Life's Simple Sevens, and we are happy to feature our speaker, Terry Lauer, from the Wood County Hospital Wellness and Occupational Medicine Department. Please welcome Terry. Morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get this presentation started. Okay, can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you again for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, basically, February was Heart Health Month, and March is, interestingly enough, National Nutrition Month. So I thought it would really be fitting for us to talk today about heart disease and what we can do to be proactive in prevention and recognizing symptoms early. Because basically... COVID has really caused a lot of problems, has really been our nemesis. And what we found is that um, there were a lot of significant increase in excessive deaths in 2020 non-related to COVID. Um, and they found it in men ages 15 to 59 and women between 25 and 44 with noted increase in heart-related events. Now, some of the reasons probably contributing to that is that our lifestyles changed. COVID had really put a kibosh to our normal way of living. So we might have adopted some unhealthy behaviors or habits that probably put us more at risk for heart disease and possibly stroke, such as, you know, think about our unhealthy eating habits. Um, we're home more, we're eating more. Maybe you're not a cook and now we were forced to be cooking. And so how do we do that? And so not understanding basically what's a good nutritious meal, or maybe there was an increased consumption of alcohol, lack of physical activity, definitely, because we couldn't go many places. Or if you were one that volunteered or worked and was always on your feet, now you were sort of confined to the home front. So, and people sometimes were a little timid to be able to go out and enjoy that nice weather. So physical activity dropped off, as well as look at the mental toll on the quarantining and the social isolation. I mean, that just even having the fear of contracting the virus, it really had a huge impact on a person's risk for cardiovascular health. But also not seeking the medical care that was needed was identified as a really strong link. And the CDC pointed out some um, statistics that I thought were pretty startling. Just when this COVID started, 80% of the adults were concerned about contracting it. So, and they didn't want to go to the hospitals or urgent cares because they were afraid that they would get COVID from another patient or a visitor in the emergency room. Another is 73% were concerned about overstressing the healthcare system. So they wanted to leave those beds in those spots for anyone that had COVID. But then 41% delayed medical care. That's 12% avoided using an urgent care or an emergency room, but 31.5% avoided the routine care. So therefore they weren't getting their blood pressures checked, their, their blood sugars checked, or maybe not getting their medicines filled. Maybe their doctor's offices weren't open or they didn't have computer connection to be able to do the telemedicine. Lots of different things can go into that. But as we dig a little deeper, you know, the rise in the cardiac deaths after the onset of the pandemic was largely found in ischemic heart disease, which is like the narrowing of the arteries and hypertension, which increased 11% and 17% respectively compared to the previous year. And the rise in the deaths were also concentrated in the areas most affected by COVID. So that's a big concern. So therefore, it's important for us to understand and be aware as to, um, you know, why, why do we have to continue talking about this? Um, you know, we've talked about heart disease and stroke for many, many, many times. But the fact is that our life for the last year has been totally COVID. And all these things that are detrimental to our health has been forgotten. So it's really important for us to remember this because the facts don't lie. So here are some of the facts. Heart disease is the number one killer of adults in the United States still. 
as well as 735,000 Americans have a heart attack every year with one in four dying from cardiovascular disease. And stroke is our number five killer of adults with it being the number one cause of long-term disability. But 37% of all Americans do not know the warning signs still. So we wanted to really make sure that we can reach out and understand and sort of make this in our forefront again. So I thought we, what we do first is start out, what is heart disease? Because it can be a little confusing when we talk about this. And, and we have this umbrella term called cardiovascular disease. And what that really means is it's a class of different kinds of diseases that involve the heart and the blood vessels, such as like the arteries and the veins. So these are, might be some of the things that you've heard, like coronary heart disease or coronary artery disease. And basically, that's just the narrowing of the arteries where plaques build up. Most likely, a lot has to do with like cholesterol. And the more cholesterol that we have, these plaques develop inside the artery and it begins to narrow the artery to the point where it can become closed off. Another thing might be heart failure where basically there's insufficient blood being pumped through the body. It's because the heart's just not working effectively and it's not doing the job it needs to do to get the blood throughout the body. And then there can be an arrhythmia or an irregular heart, heart beat well, it's more of an electrical problem where the different chambers of the heart may be beating differently. And so therefore it's not being beating effectively, which again leads to a strain on the heart and lack of blood flow throughout the body. But then there's also something called heart valve disease. And this is the malfunction malfunctioning of the heart valves. And sometimes I always think of the valves of, are like doors. Sometimes the doors close quickly too quickly. Sometimes they don't close quick enough, or maybe they don't close at all or not well enough. So therefore there can either be a backup of the blood or the blood can continue leak through those doors or those valves. So that can be um, heart valve disease, but then you can have cardiomyopathy is another muscle disease, which is basically the deterioration in the function of the muscle as well as there can be congenital issues as well. So those are all situations and there's more, but it's sort of under that umbrella of cardiovascular disease. So what we have to know is that we've already found out the fact that 735,000 people have heart attacks every year. And to understand it, what a heart attack is, is that um, it occurs when blood flows to part of the heart muscle and, and there's a blockage there. And if that clot clot cuts off the blood flow completely, then that part of the muscle dies. And some heart attacks can be real sudden and quick and intense, but most heart attacks start slowly with mild pain or discomfort. And often people aren't sure what's wrong and they wait too long to get to the help that they need. You know, they might have some denial going on, or maybe they just think it's fatigue or indigestion. But any kind of those situations, we have to be alert and we have to seek help. So these are some of the warning signs that most people experience when they're having a heart attack. And a lot of it is the chest discomfort. Most heart attacks involve the, in the center of the chest. Sometimes people describe it as an elephant sitting on their chest or something just squeezing real tight in the middle of the chest. Um, again, it can go even down the arms or even a, a radiating pain onto different areas. There can be a lot of shortness of breath. Um, basically, if you're walking across the room and you become very winded or you take just a few flight of steps and you're usually not that winded, if it really has changed, now maybe you're out of shape, that could be, but again, if it's something that's a little bit different for you and you're just winded doing the littlest things, that is a big concern as well. And going back to the discomfort in the upper body, the radiating pain, it can go down the arms, it can go up to the jaw, it can go um, in through the back. So a lot of people experience those kinds of things. But then there's other symptoms such as a cold sweat, nausea, lightheadedness. Those are some of the major symptoms, but it's not always classic because I want you to take note that women and diabetics usually will present a little differently when they're having heart attack symptoms. A lot of times they might have more shortness of breath or fatigue, sometimes it's nausea and vomiting, but a lot of times they have more back pain. 
So when we talk about a stroke, basically that is the number one cause of long-term disability and the number five killer of adults in the United States. So what it does, it affects the arteries leading to and within the brain. And it occurs when the blood vessels that carry the oxygen nutrients to the brain either become blocked by a clot or it might burst and rupture. As well as when you have a stroke, the tissues start to die in the area of the brain where the stroke occurred because there's no longer getting the oxygen that it needs to live. And therefore, it makes it a very critical situation and help needs to be, you need to get help right away. Um, because there is a timeline in which they can receive certain medications that can help decrease the risk of any kind of da uh, further damage, like paralysis or speech defects, those kinds of things. But remember, with a stroke, every second counts because time lost is really brain loss. So that's why I wanted to bring in, too, that the American Heart Association has an acronym that they use called FAST. And this will help you in identifying if someone that you see, live with, or even yourself might be having some of these warning signs. And one thing is the F, and that's the face drooping. One way you can make sure that you can identify if this is a situation is have them smile at you. If you see the corner of their mouth drooping and it's not a pure smile, that's a concern. The A is arm weakness. They might have a one arm weaker or numb. So ask them to raise their arms in front of you. And if one arm starts to drift down, then that's a concern as well. Speech difficulty is the S. And if there's slurred speech, um, if they're having a hard time understanding or expressing a word, um, ask them a simple question or have them repeat a simple sentence such as the sky is blue and see how that comes out. That's a great definition of, of uh, speech difficulty if they just are really trying hard to get out and you can see the frustration, but it's just not making sense. And then the T stands for time. You know, it's time to call 911 if the person is showing any of these symptoms, because again, um, time is important. And again, the sooner we get a stroke victim to the hospital, the sooner they're gonna get that life-saving treatment. Um, the other thing you want to also note is when you're calling 911, make sure you're identifying the time that these, these symptoms have started, because that's going to be very critical for the hospital to know as to um, the timeline that they can give these medicines. There is a clot busting drug called TPA, and it's tissue plasminogen activator. And this drug is just, it's amazing impact on the recovery of a patient because um, but the catch with it is that there is a timeline. So they have four and a half hours from when the symptoms start that they can get this medication that it will definitely help decrease some of the symptoms that they might have. And after a certain time frame, the TPA is not as effective. So it's critical to get them to the hospital, even if they're telling you, I don't want to go, it's not a big deal. You want to get them there immediately because like I said before, Time loss is brain loss, and those clot-busting drugs are going to be extremely beneficial. So what we really know is that most of these cases, they're preventable if you lead a heart-healthy lifestyle. So that's great news. We still have the ability to do something about heart disease and stroke before it happens. We just have to remind ourselves, and we have to practice some of these things. So we first all have to know who's at risk because there are some things that you can control and some things you have no control over whether you're at risk for heart disease or stroke. So some of the uncontrollable factors are obviously increased age, family history, but race also is significant. African-Americans are at higher risk and they die more often from the disease. Um, some statistics from the American Heart that I pulled out was that um, African Americans who are 20 years and older, 49% have some form of heart disease. I thought that was a very high percentage, but you have to remember that could be um, hypertension as well or any kind of heart defects. Also, Hispanic women are more likely to develop heart disease 10 years earlier than Caucasian women. So again, those are things we not, cannot control, but there are many different things that we can start changing in our lifestyle. And that's monitoring our blood pressure, our cholesterol levels, increasing that physical activity, watching our weight, 
uh, if we have type 2 diabetes, prevention or at least getting it in control, and also stop smoking. Even if we changed a couple of things, it's going to be very, very helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Life Simple 7. And these were created by the American Heart Association. And you can see very simple things that we've learned all along. Smoking, activity, cholesterol, blood pressure, eating right, losing weight, and reducing those blood sugars. And sometimes when we look at this big list of seven, you think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna to have to take my life, turn it upside down, dump out all the junk and start over. That's not really the case. What we really need to do is just focus on these things a little bit at a time. I always say a small bite at a time is gonna be helpful. And if you can work on just one of these things here and there, you're really gonna change your risk around. They say that a, a habit occurs in 21 days but it doesn't become part of your personality until at least six months. So the key is, is that we really want to, again, work on a little bit at a time for a while, let it become more of a habit, and then it will become our lifestyle change. So we're gonna look at these individually one by one. And first of all, smoking, if it's you, if it's a loved one, if it's a friend, whatever it might be, it's really important to know that um, it is the number one modifiable cause of death. Even if you smoked for years, your body can still start to repair the process as soon as you stop smoking. So that's really key. And so some of the things that you want to do is you want to talk to your healthcare provider. Um, basically, your provider can give you some insight as to what's going to be the best way to quit. Maybe you've quit many, many times and just you were successful and maybe you weren't successful, but every time someone quits, it's different. So you want to talk to your healthcare provider to see what your options are. There's medication out there and there's also over-the-counter uh, nicotine replacement options. You can even go cold turkey. There's hypnosis. There's many different things, but it's something you want to talk to your healthcare provider about. But the other thing is to, to really consider is you always want to get um, the behavioral therapy as well, because we can take the magic pill like Chantix and it will work. But if we don't change our habit by changing the behaviors, we go back to those habits again. So it's important to whatever course you want to take, make sure that you get the, the counseling with it to change those habits. The other thing is, is that you want to focus on rewards. Um, it's a lot more satisfying to make lifestyle changes when you have something to look forward to that helps motivate you. So I always encourage people to make a list of all your benefits. Think of the money that you're, you'll save, the blessings that you have in your life, which you want to be around for, whether it's family or kids or grandkids or friends, or maybe that, that vacation you want to take when you retire. And then the multiple benefits of, of your health and the, the health around you of those around you are gonna be great. So those are the things you wanna make this list. And you wanna keep this list with you, keep it handy, look at it often and update it as you go. Because there's always gonna be different things that are gonna keep encouraging you to continue to quit. The other thing is there's gonna be roadblocks. So practicing relaxation techniques are gonna be very helpful. I always talk a lot about deep breathing or visual imagery. Um, journaling, just journaling your thoughts and your feelings, or just having some mindfulness. A lot of that can really get through these difficult times. And you have to remember when we're quitting something like this, or whether you're trying to lose weight, or maybe there's a stressful thing in your life, this all works. You have to remember that these difficult times, it's just temporary. And when we're smoking, these cravings are going to keep coming back at you, and they might be tough at first, but they're not going to last forever. And once you get past that challenging part, you'll be well on your way to better health. So practice these relaxation techniques, and they're going to be very helpful for many things in your life. And the last thing is to identify your triggers. It's important to know, why am I smoking? Am I stressed? Am I bored? Am I hungry? Am I frustrated? Am I happy? What is it that makes me want to pick up that cigarette and smoke or use that nicotine? So you wanna plan for those triggers and do something else. And we always talk about the four Ds. You know, drink water, keeps your mouth busy, keeps you hydrated, deep breathe, practice those relaxation techniques that will help get you through those tough times. 
do something else. If you keep yourself busy, you're not going to want to smoke and it's not even going to be at the forefront of your brain. So, and the last thing is don't give up. Keep practicing these things, keep working through these things and you will get past that. The next one is getting active. You know, evidence is clear is that people who exercise have better health than those who don't. And a recent study even showed that, um, which is sort of sad, is that the American Heart Association said that fewer than two out of every 10 Americans get the recommended 150 minutes or more of moderate exercise a week. So looking at us on the call, there's a big percentage of us that are not getting the exercise. So it's really, really important that we need to do this. And that means that most of us are, well, basically we have to make that decision to get moving. So it's simple. If you make that decision, think about little things that you can do that um, you've always wanted to do and make goals to get there. Choose the activities that you enjoy, and that's going to be important. If you find activities that you really like and you're enjoying, you're going to stick with it longer. Another thing I encourage people to do is when you're doing these kind of activities, get a buddy to join with you because, again, they're going to push you on the days that you're not feeling like it, and you're going to be pushing them when they're not feeling like it, and it's really going to be helpful. And it's going to keep you on track, and it's going to keep you on that path to good health. You know, try some new classes that you've never done before. Maybe try a yoga class or a biking club or get a gym membership and use it. Walking programs are the best because, again, there's a lot of high success rates for people doing it, but it's free. You can do it anywhere. Anybody can do it. And you don't have to pack it up and take it with you. So, again, great. And it's free is the big thing. But also remember, getting your 150 minutes of exercise a week is going to be important. And if you're busy some days and you just can't get that time in, break that exercise into increments of 10. You can do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes in the evening. It all adds up. And you have to remember, it's better to do a little bit than none at all. Looking at cholesterol, everybody has cholesterol. And some cholesterol is important for good health but too much cholesterol can put you at risk. And when too much of the bad cholesterol called the LDL starts circulating around the body, that's when the plaques develop in the arteries. And the more that, that those waxy deposits start to build, it can close off. And what also happens is when those plaques start joining in on the lining of the artery, the artery becomes less flexible. So therefore, it's not being very effective in, in getting that blood through the body. So what can we do? First of all, you want to see your family health care provider because you need to really understand where your numbers are at. And what can you do? A lot of times it can just be changing in your diet and your exercise habits because about 25% of your cholesterol comes directly from what you eat. So we have a lot of control over those numbers if we can choose the right foods. The other thing is you wanna keep that cholesterol at least under 200 milligrams per deciliter. But then you also wanna make sure that we're getting the, the correct kinds of nutrients and foods in to keep our HDL, which is our good cholesterol high and our bad cholesterol LDL low. HDL, we want that number to be as high as possible because that's basically what is in the food that you eat. And a lot of it is genetic, but basically your body gets rid of that very quickly. And as your body gets rid of that cholesterol and works through, it makes the artery slippery to prevent things from collecting. So we always want that number to be high and the higher that number, um, the less risk you have. But then the lower number, the LDL, if that, um, if that is high, then again, those plaques build up. So again, making sure you understand what those numbers are. And you also want to stay active, making you physical activity habit. Not only will it help your cholesterol, but it's going to lower your blood pressure. It'll control your blood sugars by improving how your body uses insulin. It's going to reduce feelings of stress, just working out that and get those endorphins moving. But it's also going to control your weight and make you feel better about yourself. So it's all important, but you're only going to know what it is unless you get it checked. 
So I highly encourage people to check with their doctor, get these checked and ask the questions. Know what those numbers mean so you know how to change it. I know I've been to physician offices before and I'm told they're good or your blood pressure, it's good. Ask those questions and find out what those numbers mean and know how you can make a change. Then we also can eat better. That's just American diet. We can always do better. Um, but your body's counting on you to choose a wide variety of healthy foods that's high in nutritional value, high in fiber, but low in cholesterol and fat. So some of the actions that you can take is making sure that you're eating uh, lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fat-free and low-fat dairy products. Because again, that will lower those cholesterol levels and make you feel better. Um, also, trying to get more omega-3s or fish into your diet is very important. It's great for your heart. It's great for your brain. And if you have um, even young children in your family, it's great also for them to start incorporating those things so they know that that's a normal kind of diet that they should include every day. And also, you want to make sure that you limit your um, sodium and sugary drinks. You want to have consume at least less than 36 ounces per week. Now, it's not daily, that's weekly. So the best thing you can do is get the water in. Water's the best choice. So therefore, you know, basically take a stock of your kitchen and your pantry, look to see what you have there. One thing, never go to the grocery store on an empty stomach because most likely you're gonna be looking for those things that you're craving. You wanna make sure that you go on a full stomach because therefore you're going to choose the appropriate things um, that is gonna be a nutritional, um, a good nutritional choice. And they always say too, is always shop the exterior of the store. That's where all your fruits and vegetables, your grains and your protein and your milk and those kinds of things are located. When we start going down the aisles, that's where all the, the uh, trans fats and the, the bad foods and the processed foods are located. So again, just consider shopping that exterior of the store and that can be helpful as well. And the other thing is to keep a journal. You know, even if you did it for a day or two, um, if you were to write down every single bite that you put in your mouth, it could be pretty scary because we think, oh, it's just a little bite. It's not going to mean much. But again, those little bites do add up and they do count. And it will give you a really good idea as to what you're eating every day. And are you eating from the appropriate food groups? There's also lots of apps out there that you can get. MyFitnessPal.com is an excellent one. There's My Plate Calorie Counter, My Net Diary. There's many different ones out there, but it also will help you to be able to uh, journal what you're eating, but also tells you, hey, I need to get a couple more vegetables in, or hey, I'm low on fruits today. It will really help you to stay on track and making sure that you are um, getting everything in that you need every day. And again, say no to those foods and beverages that have a lot of sugar and sodium because it will work against you. I don't know if you've ever gone on a binge of M&Ms or right now Girl Scout cookies. Um, maybe you haven't eaten fast food in a while and all of a sudden you went through the, the fast food lane and got the burger and the french fries. Um, it really makes you feel sluggish, makes you feel not so well. Um, so the more we can limit these from our diet, the better we're going to feel all the way around. So the next thing we're going to talk about is weight. You know, if you're overweight, don't waste your energy feeling bad about it. What we have to do is sort of focus on what we can change. The BMI is a good indicator that everyone understands. And where your BMI is, you really want it to be less than 25 is optimal, especially for cardiovascular health. So if your number is higher than that, so what you have to do is we have to really understand that we have to have a balance of calories in versus calories out. If we eat more calories than we need, we gain the weight. If we eat fewer calories than we use, then we can lose weight. So again, 
that food diary is going to come in handy for that. Um, when you're getting tired and you're hungry, you're more likely again to stop for fast food or snack on something that's um, not healthy for you. So plan on healthy meals and snacks. Make sure you buy those easy snacks around the house. A lot of times I will um, cook up a bunch of hard boiled eggs or I'll have some string cheese or I'll have the fruit all, all washed and maybe put on a fruit plate on the table. Or I will also cut up fruits or vegetables and have that in the refrigerator. So when I come home late at night and I'm trying to get dinner ready, I'm gonna nibble on the vegetables so I fill up on those rather than pulling the chip bag out and eating those. So it just gives you some ideas of things that you can do. And the other thing is read the labels. Make sure you understand the label reading. Look for the foods that are high in sugar, saturated fat, trans fats, put them back on the shelf and look for the things that are gonna be much more nutritional value for you. And also remember, regular exercise, 30 minutes a day is essential. So again, it's gonna help with not only losing weight, but it's gonna help with your abdominal fat and it's gonna preserve your muscle as well. So win-win for everything if we can include that in your diet and your daily routine. Managing blood pressure. So hypertension is the single most significant risk factor for heart disease. And uncontrolled high blood pressure can be dangerous for your, for your body and your heart. And they say hypertension is called the silent killer because there really are no signs and symptoms. And one out of every three adults have hypertension and they're not even aware of it. Um, there are some, uh, again, statistics that one in three adults have high blood pressure, yet about 21% don't even know they have it. And of those who have high blood, high blood pressure, 69% are receiving treatment, but only 45% actually have their blood pressure in control. So that could be because they're not taking their medicine, they're not checking their blood pressure, they're not trying to work on relaxation techniques to decrease those stressful situations. So what you can do is again, know your numbers. If you don't have a blood pressure machine at home, get one. I used to encourage people to use them at, at Walmart or Kroger, but now with COVID, those are sort of um, blocked off. So you can go to Walgreens or any um, pharmacy and they sell them. I know Meyer even sells them and you can get a nice blood pressure machine under $35. So again, that might be something to consider, but what is normal is anything under 120 over 80. They've changed the standards for blood pressure probably about four or five years ago now. And first stage of hypertension is 130 over 80. So again, we want to push for that 120 over 80 lower than that as a normal. And again, when you're at the doctor's office, ask those questions. What is my number? What can I do to control it? How can I change that? And journal those numbers. If you're hypertensive, Journal your numbers when you get those blood pressures, because when we go to the doctor and maybe you go once a year to make sure that everything's working in good working order and you need to get your new medications, it's hard for a physician to be able to look at that one number and make a decision as to whether they need to keep your blood pressure medicine at the, at the normal dosage. Do they need to increase it or do we need to begin one? Maybe you had a stressful morning. Maybe you didn't sleep the night before. And if your numbers come in high, that's the number they're gonna to have to go off of whether how they're gonna treat it. So if you can journal those numbers and put dates and times, that's very helpful for your physician to be able to make determinations on how to maintain um, your medication or if they need to prescribe medicine for you. And again, learning healthy habits for eating well and staying active. Again, the more we move, the more we eat healthy, we stress less, we watch those sodium levels, it's all gonna have a factor on your blood pressure. And then finally, looking at your blood glucose. Basically, high and uncontrolled blood sugars can increase your risk not only for diabetes, but also for heart disease and stroke. So what you really need to do is make sure that you're making good food choices. You know, choose a good balance of nutritious foods. It's a good idea to eat small, small portions, like six small meals a day, but also getting enough water can also help lower your blood sugar. And then again, use physical activity to low blood sugars. Because again, it breaks down carbs more quickly, 
which helps get them out of the bloodstream and it lowers the blood sugars. And for diabetic individuals, exercise is often just as essential as a medication because it's so effective on blood sugar regulation. So again, if you can't do the 150 minutes or the 30 minutes a day, just get in what you can most days of the week and know what your blood sugars are. If you're diabetic, talk to your physician if you need to get a blood sugar machine at home to be able to monitor those. Um, also, talk to your physician about getting a dietitian or a nutrition educator on board. Maybe you were diagnosed years ago and you know you think that you're doing well, but the blood sugars are still higher, that A1C is still up there. Talk to your physician and seeing if you can meet with a dietitian just to sort of get you back on track. Maybe your lifestyle has changed. Maybe you were working then and now you're retired or maybe jobs have changed or stress levels have changed. Maybe health conditions have come into play, but it's good to be able to talk to a dietitian to see where you're at currently and what kind of changes you can make to keep that blood sugar stable and in control. So the big question is, what can you do? First of all, know if you're at risk. Know your personal risk that you have currently and know your numbers. The only way you're going to know those numbers is by getting them checked and asking those questions. And be aware of symptoms. We talked about those symptoms today. Talk to your physician, especially if you're noticing any of these that is a change for you. Don't, don't wait. It's always good to make sure that... Um, I'd rather them tell me that it was a false alarm than having a situation that I sat on at home and, and did not get help for. Practice those healthy lifestyle habits that we talked about today and really make sure that you follow up with your doctor. It's highly encouraged to write down questions before you see the doctor. Probably the week before all these ideas come into your head of what you want to talk to them, but when you get in there, you sort of forget. So I encourage people to write those questions down and go down that list when you're talking to him or her so you can make sure that all your needs are met. Get your wellness and preventative exams. If it's time for um, your, your yearly wellness exam with your doctor, get it done. If it's time for your um, colonoscopy, get those scheduled. If it's, he's been telling you for a while to get a blood sugar machine, go get it purchased. Find out how to use that. Work with your doctor or the dietitian to even know how to use those machines. And that's going to be very helpful. But get it on your calendar just as you would anything else and make sure you keep those appointments. And if you're a smoker, stop doing it. We can always help. There's many, many resources out there. There's the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association. You can always give us a call at Wood County Hospital. We have smoking cessation programs as well. And we can also give you other resources that are available online or that you can do to, to be able to help you or your loved one be able to stop smoking. But the biggest thing is learn the warning signs and do not have the denial going on Call 911 if you see those symptoms that we talked about today. But the biggest thing is together, we're building a healthier future, one heart at a time. Share this information, bring about awareness is key. And again, having a healthier future is desired. We all want to live a healthy lifestyle, but we also want to enjoy those retirement years and all the people um, that come into our life at those times as well. So make yourself a priority and get followed up with your family doctor if there's anything abnormal. Any questions that anyone has for me? Wonderful, thank you so much, Terry, for sharing that very valuable information. And I'm gonna stop our